to the reading room everyone. Today we are reading Walden Pond by Henry David Thoreau. Now, I already kind of gave you the introduction to him. We actually already read this intro together in class just to give us a little bit more of a background about today's author. Remember, as I am reading today, I want you to really be listening for those sensory details and that descriptive language. That's what we've been talking about this week. How do these authors use descriptive language in order to describe the scene and the setting that they are trying to get across to readers. So here we go with Walden Pond. Standing on the smooth sandy beach at the east end of the pond in a calm September afternoon, when a slight haze makes the opposite shoreline indistinct, I have seen whence came the expression, the glassy surface of a lake, when you invert your head it looks like a thread of finest gossamer stretched across the valley and gleaming against the white, distant white pine woods, separating one stratum of the atmosphere from another. Guys, gossamer can almost kind of be described like um, they say here, it's a thin, delicate fabric. Um, you'll oftentimes find it similar to like tulle, okay? Um, and so just really, really thin. So right here from the very get-go, we see lots of examples of descriptive language. The glassy surface of a lake. So no movement whatsoever on this lake. Very, very still water, okay? Um, and then it says here, it looks like a thread of finest gossamer, okay? So this could be... Um, <clears throat> an example here of some figurative language that he is using as well, okay? You would think that you could walk dry under it through the opposite hills and that the swallows which skim over might perch on it. Indeed, they sometimes dive below this line, as it were by mistake, and are undeceived. As you look over the pond westward, you are obliged to employ both your hands to defend your eyes against the reflected, as well as the true sun, for they are equally bright. And if, between the two, you survey its surface critically, it is literally as smooth as glass. Okay, so this right here, as smooth as glass. This would be an example of the simile, right? Um, a comparison using like or as. So he is now saying that the water is as smooth as glass, except where the skater insects at equal intervals scattered over its whole extent by their motions in the sun produce the finest imaginable sparkle on it, or perchance a duck plumes itself. Or, as I have said, a swallow skims so low as to touch it. It may be that in the distance a fish describes an arc of three or four feet in the air, and there is one bright flash where it emerges, and another where it strikes the water. Sometimes the whole silvery arc is revealed, or here and there, perhaps, is a thistle down floating on its surface, which the fish fishes dart at and so dimple it again. It is like molten glass cool, but not congealed. And the few motes in it are pure and beautiful, like the imperfections in glass. You may often detect a yet smoother and darker water separated from the rest as if by an invisible cobweb, boom of the water nymphs resting on it. From a hilltop, you can see a fish leap in almost any part for not a pickerel or shiner picks an insect from this smooth surface, but it manifestly disturbs the equilibrium of the whole lake. Okay, so just here within the first two pages, all he is doing is describing this lake. He really wants us to understand how calm this lake is. Literally the only things that are bothering it we might see some darker water where we have some cobwebs on it. We may see a fish leap up, okay? However, for the most part, it's a very, very calm, smooth, glass-like body of water, okay? So he's definitely being very descriptive, but wants us to really understand exactly what this body of water looks like. It is wonderful with what elaborateness this simple fact is advertised. This 
the sign murder will out. And from my distant perch, I distinguish the circling undulations when they are half a dozen rods in diameter. So what do we mean here by murder will out, okay? He's saying an expression meaning that a crime cannot be hidden, but it will be discovered and punished, okay? So he's talking about this fish going to murder something? We'll see. You can even detect a water bug ceaselessly progressing over the smooth surface a quarter of a mile off for they furrow the water slightly, making a conspicuous ripple bounded by two diverging lines. But the skaters glide over it without ripping it, rippling it perceptibly. When the surface is considerably agitated, there are no skaters nor water bugs on it. But apparently, in calm days, they leave their havens and adventurously glide forth from the shore by short impulses till they completely cover it. It is a soothing employment on one of those fine days in the fall when all the warmth of the sun is fully appreciated to sit on a stump on such a height as this, overlooking the pond the study and study the dimpling circles which are incessantly inscribed on its otherwise invisible surface amid the reflected skies and trees. Over this great expanse, there is no disturbance, but it is thus at once gently smoothed away and assuaged, as when a vase of water is jarred, the trembling circles seek the shore and all is smooth again. Okay, so still here, Thoreau is really wanting us to understand the feeling that he gets when he sits and looks out onto this lake. Okay, it's definitely um, a very relaxing feeling. He says the warmth of the sun, so we can imagine how that feels, right? Um, we can see someone sitting on a stump looking over a pond, okay? Um, we can see the skies, the trees, the dimples in the water. We can kind of imagine all of these things thanks to the way that Thoreau is describing them so well. Not a fish can leap or an insect fall on the pond, but it is thus reported in circling dimples and lines of beauty as it were the constant welling up of its fountain, the gentle pulsing of its life, the heaving of its breast. The thrills of joy and thrills of pain are undistinguishable. How peaceful the phenomena of the lake. Again, the works of man shine as in the spring. Hey, every leaf and twig and stone and cobweb sparkles now at mid-afternoon as when covered with dew in a spring morning. Every, sorry, you guys, these silly pop-ups. Every motion of an oar or an insect produces a flash of light as if an oar falls. How sweet the echo. Okay, so here we can hear an echo of an oar falling over. And again, emphasizing how peaceful the phenomena of the lake. Okay, talking about how peaceful, how wonderful this lake is. In such a day in September or October, Walden is a perfect forest mirror set round with stones as precious to my eye as a fewer or rarer, nothing so fair, so pure, and at the same time so large as a lake perchance lies on the surface of the earth. Sky water, it needs no fence. Nations come and go without defiling it. It is a mirror which no stone can crack. You guys, think about how a lake can be like a mirror. If it is still enough, you can see the reflection in it, okay? So that's what he's referring to here when he says, it, it is a mirror which no stone can crack, okay? Whose quicksilver will never wear off whose guiding nature continually repairs. No storms, no dust can dim its surface ever fresh. A mirror in which all impurity presented to its sinks 
swept and dusted by the sun's hazy brush, this, the light dust cloth, which retains no breath that is breathed on it, but sends its own to float as clouds high above its surface and be reflected in its bosom still. One November afternoon, in the calm at the end of a rainstorm of several days duration, when the sky was completely overcast and the air was full of mist, I observed that the pond was remarkably smooth so that it was difficult to distinguish its surface, though it no longer reflected the bright hints of October, but the somber November colors of the surrounding hills. Though I passed over it as gently as possible, the slight undulations produced by my boat extended almost as far as I could see and gave a ribbed appearance to the reflections. But as I was looking over the surface, I saw here and there at a distance a faint glimmer as if some skater insects which had escaped the frost might be collected there or perchance the surface being so smooth, betrayed where a spring welled up from the bottom, paddling gently to one of those pl these places. I was surprised to find myself surrounded by myriads of small perch, about five inches long, of a rich bronze color in the green water, sporting there and constantly rising to the surface and dimpling it, sometimes leaving bubbles on it. In such transparent and seemingly bottomless water reflecting the clouds, I seemed to be floating through the air as in a balloon, and their swimming impressed me as a kind of flight or hovering, as if they were a compact flight of birds passing just beneath my level on the right or left, their fins like sails set all around them. was cut off square at the ends. It was very clumsy, but lasted a great many years before it became waterlogged and perhaps sank to the bottom. He did not know whose it was. It belonged to the pond. He used to make a cable for his anchor of strips of hickory bark tied together. An old man, a potter, who lived by the pond before the revolution, told him once that there was an iron chest at the bottom and that he had seen it. Sometimes it would come floating up to the shore, but when you went toward it, it would go back into deep water and disappear. I was pleased to hear of the old log canoe, which took the place of an Indian one of the same material, but more graceful construction, which perchance had first been a tree on the bank, and then, as it were, fell into the water, to float there for a generation, the most proper vessel for the lake. I remember that when I first looked into these depths, there were many large trunks to be seen and distinctly lying on the bottom, which had either been blown over formerly or left on the ice at the last cutting when wood was cheaper, but now they have mostly disappeared. When I first paddled a boat on Walden, it was completely surrounded by thick and lofty pine and oak woods and in some of its coves, grapevines had run over the trees next to the water and formed bowers under the which a boat could pass. The hills which form its shores are so steep, and the woods on them are, were then so high that as you look down from the west end, it had the appearance of an amphitheater or some kind of sylvan spectacle. Okay, so if you don't know what an amphitheater is, um, it's like uh, sometimes, you know, a lot of concerts or plays are put on at amphitheaters. Typically, it's outside, okay, a round or oval arena for performances. So it says it had the appearance of an amphitheater. So somewhere for performances, for some kind of sylvan spectacle. What does that mean? Sylvan having to do with woods and forests and a spectacle is like a performance for the public. Almost done, guys. I have spent many an hour when I was younger floating over its surface as the zephyr willed 
having paddled my boat to the middle and lying on my back across the seats in a summer forenoon, dreaming awake until I was aroused by the boat touching the sand, and I arose to see what shore my fates had impelled me to, days when idleness was the most attractive and productive industry. Many a forenoon have I stolen away, preferring to spend thus the most valued part of the day, for I was rich, if not in money, in sunny hours and summer days, and spent them lavishly. So this tells us that he is incredibly grateful for the experience that he has in nature. He says, I may not be rich in money, however, the hours and summer days that I have spent out enjoying nature are worth far more than anything. Nor do I regret that I did not waste more of them in the workshop or the teacher's desk. So he's saying he doesn't regret a minute of his time that he has spent outside. But since I left those shores, the wood choppers have still further laid them waste. And now for many a year, there will be no more rambling through the aisles of the wood with occasional vistas through which you see the water. My muse may be excused if she is silent henceforth. How can you expect the birds to sing when their groves are cut down? So here it's saying that he, I left those, shore, the, those shores, the wood choppers. So he's saying he used to chop down some of these trees. However, now he realizes that if he continues to cut down these trees, he is disturbing nature. He is taking the homes away from animals, okay? How do you expect the birds to be able to sing without their homes, he says. All right, so that is our last page there, okay? We're going to come back into the main room and discuss a little bit. So really, you guys, this entire excerpt here from Henry David Thoreau just really explains to us um, the beauty of nature that he felt, the sense of calmness, the sense of relaxation that he received from nature. He says he does not regret a single minute that he spent in nature. It was absolutely, completely worth it.